Welcome to MHN Voices, our series through which we present insightful discussions among industry thought leaders, moderated by our editorial team. Today's discussion examines the key issues shaping student housing in 2023 and beyond. I'm Suzanne Silverman, Editorial Director of Multi-Housing News, and I'm here today with Greg Faulkner, President of Humphreys & Partners Architects, Ryan Lang, Vice Chairman and Head of Student Housing at Newmark, Barrett Lowell, Managing Director and Head of Education Asset Management at Harrison Street, Donna Price, President of the Price Company, and David Rose, CIO of Student Living at CA Ventures. We are recording this session and it will be available for later viewing. In addition, we're going to leave some time at the end to answer your questions, but please feel free to submit them at any time during the webinar. And thank you to those who submitted some in advance. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Let's kick off today's discussion with a couple of broader questions to set the stage, and then we can talk more about the development and investment aspects. Donna, the big story today is student housing's position relative to multifamily. Multifamily had been the big growth story and has slowed in the face of the slowing economy. How does student housing performance compare? So it's, it's a great question. Um, and to find the answer, you have to go back two years uh, when the pandemic began. Uh, we were, it's, it's the, the pandemic started to make itself known uh, probably around March. Uh, by March, 70% or more of the student housing uh, stock had already been leased. So um, it did not affect us as much that year as it did multifamily. Multifamily found themselves having to drop rents, do significant concessions. Um, and so they started at a much different base than we did. So when you look at last year <clears throat> and people say, well, you know, student housing did on average four and a half percent and uh, conventional did 14 and a half. You have to look at the base from which each started. You know, student housing uh, has always been known for it's 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 very flat. I mean, you know, we we have we don't have the um, uh, the, the peaks and the valleys that conventional does. So basically, we never were as, as adversely affected as they were. Uh, you know, that being said, you know, they had um, spectacular rent growth last year. Um, you know, the um, student housing, we had what we consider to be good, solid rent growth, revenue growth. And I think that we'll, we're looking forward to an even better year this year. And just to, just to add to that, I think, Donna, you're, you're spot on. But one of the interesting things to look at, too, is that the trade-offs that you're referring to on the multi-side were on per, a percentage of the overall building, right? So you could see 10% of trade-outs on, on the multi-deal or 20% trade-outs, whereas on student, now we're seeing 9.3% effective rank growth over the prior year for the 23 academic year, and that's on 100% of all of the beds for the upcoming academic year, which I think is a pretty big and important differentiating factor where, you know, multi was getting big trade-outs, but not necessarily on 100%. And so we're finally seeing this massive catch up in rents on the student side where we hadn't been signing leases for that period of time where multi was seeing those trade outs on portions of their property where now we're seeing this big catch up. There was a big lag in rents and now this big catch up in rents for a student on 100% of all of the beds throughout the country right now, which is a pretty big differentiating factor. And obviously one of the big, big points of, um, of, of positive news for the student sector moving forward, I think into 24 as well. Hey, great. Uh, Barrett, what's your outlook for college enrollment and how will that impact demand for student housing both overall and in any particular regions that uh, really stand out? And let's talk both short and long term. Yeah, no, it's strong, but I do think there's a uh, delineation delineation between um, some of the top tier institutions, a lot of times categorized into power five versus some lower tier institutions. I think not all the data is out yet for this year, but I can tell you for 2021, you know, the top tier institutions bucketed, you know, uh, for power five, it then grew by 2.6% fall of 21 compared to decline for non power five of 1.9% with an overall um, increase. And I think it, you saw in some prior recessions, overall enrollment, you know, especially for student housing tends to grow with either um, potential uh, working uh, people heading back to school, um, you know, or just, you know, trying to expand their educational platforms. We see that trend continuing. 
And even as you'll you'll hear potentially from others with some of that population decline expected to happen between 2025 to 2028, the, the, the impact on that post-secondary student level is, is relatively muted. And we just continue to see a lot of the, um, the stronger top tier institutions having that ability to flex um, and pull enrollment, not only from out of state, but also in state um, from some of the smaller tier schools, which benefits a lot of the, uh, the product and demand that everyone, you know, I'm sure on this call and otherwise, the, the institutions that groups are targeting. Okay, great. Um, Ryan, you started to talk about <clears throat> rents going forward and um, coming off of what Barrett was just saying about the outlook for enrollment, anything further to add on that, how it will impact occupancies and uh, any further details on rents? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, again, ex rent growth is at its highest historic level ever, part partially due to what Barrett was just referencing on enrollment. We're seeing enrollment increase, particularly at the, the power five major publics throughout the country. Ivy League schools continue to do very well. Those with lower acceptance rates, obviously, are um, at any point could kind of turn on the spigot, so to speak, and increase enrollment pretty dramatically. And I think that's partially what, what you're seeing here. You have a couple of things that are contributing to the, to the rent growth that we're talking about, which is north of 9%, which is a historic record. One of which is what Barrett just talked about on the enrollment side, which continues to trend very positively moving forward as historically over the past five to 10 years on the power five major publics continues to look, um, look the same going forward as well. The second story of that is just supply tapering at a dramatic level, level uh, supplies at its lowest level ever in the past decade. And so we have supply tapered dramatically. We have kind of uh, several students that took a gap year during COVID. So you're seeing enrollment catch up on that aspect. And then you're seeing that rent catch up to go along with it. So we've got a confluence of factors that are all contributing to a super tight su supply pipeline, uh, rent, uh, effective rent growth that's highest record ever. And then pre-leasing velocity now leasing faster than we've ever seen before. We're, we're now 12 plus percent uh, ahead of where we were at the same time last year, getting that, uh, the, getting those rent increases as well. So there's a, a lot of positive things to look toward. And, and again, I think 24 is likely to continue to see some of those trends continue on here based on what we're seeing right now and how quickly so many deals have leased up over the past three to six months. I think that lag effect is important too, that that Wang notes in that we've had so much pent up demand mixed with a uh, the lower supply fundamentals that you're gonna see because our rents reset once a year versus multi that continues to churn, that that you're gonna see that outsized rent growth, not only for this year, but we see it going on you know, for next year because of you know, that dynamic is just taking place for our sector the last couple of years. And so um, you know, coming out of that and heading into um, you know, this, the market that we're in today with those fundamentals, you're gonna see that uh, you know, continue on, whereas you're starting to already see the tapering um, in multifamily, um, you know, today in today's environment. Um, so I think a lot of those stats you're, you may not hear about until everyone rounds out for the next year. And we can tell you, we've already repriced within this current pre-leasing level, another 2%, what we originally budgeted just four months ago, which kind of speaks to uh, the pricing power a lot of uh, companies have today. So also contributing to, to it is not just enrollment, but also job growth. Uh, in, in these different markets, because what happens in a mature student housing market um, is that you've got job growth that actually pushes a lot of your students um, out of the shadow market and, and, and separates, has, there's a more a, a clear differentiation between student housing and conventional. Because remember the old numbers we always use and they haven't changed that much, you know, uh, purpose built, uh, maybe is 25% of the market, 25% uh, is on campus and 50% uh, is in the shadow market. Well, I think purpose built may be taking uh, two or three more of those shadow market points. But what you're finding in certain markets is that if the job growth is really good, like in Austin or Raleigh, uh, even if you don't have uh, uh, particularly strong enrollment growth, uh, you will find that that you're losing some of your student supply. In the last two years, we've had seven projects that were sold that had been student projects that were converting to um, you know, to to conventional. The other thing is too is the student that the international students have not truly engaged right now. I mean, they're coming back, but but I think that uh, the largest part of them, you know, is still to uh, to come. And I think that we're gonna, you know, that that's going to be a real benefit. So, Greg, I, uh, you know, it's hard for me to be quiet. So I was going to say one other thing is, <laughs> yeah, our, and Barrett, you guys all know this. It's such a uh, it's so tough to get these deals done from a zoning and title on new development zoning entitlement and that's a year and 
then drawings and permitting, and then you know two years to build these things. It's it's, it's kind of like the conventional side. Job growth drives everything, like Donna says, but uh, it's real hard to overbuild. <laughs> and I know some people may argue that some different markets are different. I know on the tier one things, but it's a uh, you know, it probably is really good. Um, you know, we're not doing 55,000 beds anymore. Maybe we're doing 35 or 40, I think. But uh, it, it doesn't hurt the market overall if you've already got projects there or you're planning new ones when, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty constrained as far as getting things going fast. David, you're shaking your head yes, I think. <laughs> so we've touched on some of the big issues or the big trends for the sector as we look forward to the next school year. Um, interesting comments, Donna, about job growth and what that's going to do to uh, demand for the housing and how some of that may change and the international students coming back and, of course, those COVID gap year students. Are there any other big issues or trends that uh, that people should think about, whether they're interested in, in it, whether they're already active or interested in getting active in the student housing market, either from the acquisition or the development side as we look toward the new school year? Yeah, I think we, we've hit just about all of them, but just tying it together, I think the contradiction to sustain momentum of student, you know, I feel like a year ago, um, all of our staffs were trending in the right direction, but you talk to investors who are also active participants in multifamily and they almost yawn at you a little bit because of the outsized rent growth that they're seeing in, in that portion of the residential sector. Uh, but now we've eclipsed them. If you look at the national data, as Ryan was sharing, you know, closing in on almost double digit effective rent growth. And with that decade low of new supply, I think all of us here feel pretty good about both 23, 24 and 24, 25 and beyond being a, you know, a state sustained level of growth above those long term averages, probably with some cool down. Um, so you, you put it all together and, and you start thinking, if I'm a, an investor across multiple parts of the residential slices, it's an interesting time to think about adding student to your portfolio. The other piece that's interesting too is that the um, uh, what the universities learned during COVID was how much more popular the uh, low density uh, housing was. So most of the um, new construction on campus is all about de-densification. So there, there, there'll be, and I think the next three to four years, I think somebody told me that there's a record number of RFPs right out right now by universities, but basically they're going to be taking. Um, beds offline um, and then recreating a, a, a lower, you know, a smaller bed footprint. But the key thing is for the next two to three years, you could start to see just a, you know, the, the, the number of beds going down while they tear them down and haven't built the new ones. That's interesting. So let's talk some more about the supply side. And, and I think that we've really covered where supply stands currently and, and possibility, as you were just saying, Donna, for it going down. Um, well, first of all, let's look at the current ec economy. Um, Barrett, do you see student housing as really being recession proof? And, and how do you plan for the future when you're in the midst of a recession? Obviously, you're planning in advance. It takes a while to, uh, to get properties built. But uh, given the current economic outlook, is it still a good time to move forward with, uh, with new development projects? Yeah, I mean, certainly recession resilient, I will say, because you know, no one in you know commercial real estate is obviously immune to rising interest rates, which obviously impact everyone on the ability to get um, deals done at yields um, and or exit uh, returns that make sense. But um, as everyone's kind of commented on, you know, our fundamentals have never, it's just, they've never been stronger. You know, you, you mix up with COVID, the supply levels, like, you know, going back to the supply comment, um, Suzanne, our supply uh, constraint the last couple of years had nothing to do with anything being overbuilt um, or developers or equity sources being over leveraged or anything of that nature. It was tied to obviously, you know, uh, ma many factors coming out of code and the inability to get deals capitalized, developers having, you know, held on to an entitlement title project for just a bit too long to still make it pencil um, because of some of the factors coming out of COVID. And those, I still think those deals get done over the next couple of years, it's just going to be, you know, more of a, a lag effect, like we were talking about earlier. But um, you've seen it in the stats, and going back to the GFC, we talked about that ad nauseum, um, you know, on some of the panels I've been on with Donna. But um, the you know, student always performs coming out of that because of the return to school, 
the mm -hmm. outcomes produced by going to universities, um, income gaps between students that can get educations at a variety of institutions, not necessarily just top tier throughout, but th those are real numbers. And so we continue, we continue to expect enrollment to trend that way. Um, like we said, we, we see the runway for student over the next few years, probably some of the strongest they will ever be. So when we talk about recessions, we could have a conversation for a while about whether that's actually happening and what that means and what the Fed does. Right. Um, but yeah, we, we we are highly bullish on where the sector is heading over the next couple of years, regardless of where interest rates go. Yeah, I mean, to, to Barrett's point, if you look at every downturn dating back to the 1950s, we've seen enrollment increase at post-secondary at universities and, and both graduate and undergraduate enrollment in every single instance. And so there's certainly a case we made it's recession resilient. On top of that, I think you made the case that we're relatively affordable right now too. So going back to the trade out comments that we were talking about on the multi side, the shadow market was always really looked at as like, all right, what is, what is the shadow market? What am I competing against that maybe it's not purpose built product? One, a lot of that stuff is functionally obsolete. But two, a lot of that really was getting 20 plus percent trade outs and really isn't that affordable. So their whole shtick, so to speak, on the shadow market was that we were an affordable alternative to the purpose built product closer to campus. So that's not really, not, it's really not um, any longer the case where the purpose built product actually looks relatively affordable compared to the shadow market now. And then second to that, if you look at on campus product, on campus product in terms of rent, so stuff that the university actually owns, rents have increased at a quicker pace than they have for purpose built products. So if you look at on campus compared to the shadow market, compared to the purpose built product, Personal product looks relatively affordable and it's closer into campus. <clears throat> and obviously it's much, much higher amenitized than what we typically see there. So interesting from a bunch of different lenses for sure. Yeah, it is. Let, let's delve more into the nuts and bolts here. Um, Donna, what's the capital climate for development right now? So it, very similar to uh, global financial crisis in that your uh, domestic institutional funds um, are sort of on the sideline. Um, you know, the folks that we've been doing business with, they're talking, we're still having, um, you know, calls each week, but, you know, I, I would say they're relatively quiet. Who's really active right now are the international uh, investors. And that was, that was interesting. It was the exact same thing that happened um, after the GFC. The, the international investors were first back into the market, especially those folks who already have their money here and are receiving cash flow. So, um, you know, we will not have, um, you know, as active a year this year as we've had in the last couple of years, uh, but we will still do some transactions. The the fever and the pitch of the of the last couple of years is actually not healthy um, for student housing property management. You know, when you, I mean, we were we were blowing through our target numbers you know, in, um, in, in, in 18 months, 12 months, eight months, 18 months, instead of the three to five years. And so what happens is it's really disruptive to your student housing, uh, the, man, the, the, the staff, you know, our staff wants to stay with the company. And if you're, if you're in conventional, you might have multiple properties in the same market, student housing, not so much. So, you know, it was in, incredibly disruptive. So, you know, I don't mind that we slow that down a little bit. Um, I think that that will create a more sustainable long-term market. I don't think I don't think Ryan agrees with you, Donna. Pardon me. I think Ryan wants to see more churn. Uh, and then, yeah. uh, <laughs> I was okay with how things were looking last year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we can continue on with that. Uh, uh, Barry, I'm still I'm still suffering from when you you mentioned being with me and the word ad nauseum in, in the same sentence. So. <laughs> really. So uh, but, Barrett. Oh, sorry. Somebody about no, I was just to no, I was just say to Donna's point though, we are we're we're starting to see new capital come into the space too, which I think is interesting. And mm -hmm. again, this all ties back into some of the multi versus student stuff that we're figuring out, not to keep picking on the multi industry. They've obviously had some bright points too. Um, but if you look at where multi is trending for rates right now compared to where students trending, if you look at the cap rate disparity, which is roughly 33 basis points right now, where students trading wider than multi. And then the fundamentals going forward for about 23 and 24 look a little bit better for, for student right now. So you're seeing a lot more groups look to the space. Mm -hmm. Several deals that we've done recently just over the past three to six months have been newer equity entrants that are um, more specific to multi or other asset classes have really never traditionally done student looking to get into the space and looking to potentially scale up on the second half of this year. 
um, in multiple groups that you know are, are largely a little bit out of the space right now that have been more core oriented, open into funds, obviously not being as active on the core front. Those seen an opportunity to say, well, maybe I can come in and, and really pick up some high quality real estate with cap rates a bit wider than they maybe should be compared to other asset classes and then catch some of the tailwinds for some of that future growth as well for 23 and 24, which is why you're seeing a lot of this new capital come to the space, not just institutional capital, which there's a lot of that, but family office capital, private capital. And to give you an example, we just sold a deal up in Charleston, which was a, to, to a first time buyer of student housing. That's a long term holder of family office holding it for 10 years and looking to do the same thing over and over and over again. So I think you're going to continue to see that over the next three to six months as well, where you see different groups from different sectors come into student uh, and not just do one-offs, but potentially look for scaling opportunities as well. So what, one of the problems that we have is um, is our success. So in student housing, you know, the, the, um, the funds, uh, the institutional funds have these allocations. And so they start to have denominator issues so that, you know, our, 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 uh, our, our, our asset class has done so well that uh, it starts to overpower some of the other um, uh, uh, classes, and so they actually have to potentially sell just so they can they can um, you know get their um, allocations correct. So it's really a you know to a certain extent we're being penalized for having you know done done really well. Valuations, yeah. So just to get us back to development, so we could talk some more about that, and then talk, we'll talk some more about investment as well. Um, Barrett, to what extent are construction costs a development hurdle for the next year or so? Clearly, that's been a problem across any real estate in, in, in recent times. Do you see that continuing to be a big hurdle? Yeah, I mean, and David should comment on this as well. It's certainly a challenge. I mean, we, we, I, would, I would say that that historic of the last year, even more so than capital constraints, or certainly the fundamentals has been the biggest challenge because there's obviously been a run of it started with the supply chain constraints coming out of COVID and just the inability to get raw materials on site, the proper uh, subcontractors in a position where they can deliver, you know, on a timeline, um, you know, uh, that meets the needs of the, the project schedule. Um, anecdotally, we're hearing now that a lot of that run up, whether uh, certainly um, lumber has come back in line, but even, you know, some concrete and others, uh, uh, material costs have come back in line and they're not going up, but they're at a new level, right? They're at a new baseline than what they historically were. And so those underwriting standards have been challenging to, you know, make obviously the rents align with what that's going to look like in your pro forma. But the good news is I think we're now in a better place to be able to underwrite it. Whereas before there's a lot more uncertainty. Uh, and, and if we're able to lock that in, you know, before we go into project, you know, because a lot of times we won't know where the final buyout's going to, you know, uh, come in. And so there's a little bit of uncertainty there. So building in more cushion than we typically have been able to has, um, you know, put a, some, a couple of deals to the sidelines for us. But having more of that certainty, I think we're in a better position today than we were six months ago. But but David should jump in there as well. Please, David. Yeah, no, uh, lumber has gotten a lot of the publicity and uh, has almost fully round tripped back to pre-COVID pricing almost, right. but that doesn't always mean that it's flowed through to the project yet. Um, so still a little more expensive than what you'd see if you just did a Google search for the, the chart. Um, but in general, materials are up um, and not all of them have round tripped. I think what's interesting now is uh, available availability of labor is still a bit of a challenge in the student space where you're in markets that are big deals in the student housing world. They're not the major metropolitan areas always uh, mm -hmm. where multifamily construction is and can be a little bit challenging <clears throat> there. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, interest costs are up 500 basis points or more. I think we'll talk a little bit about that on financing when you think about the spread plus the base rate where we are. Um, it's all squeezing a little bit on 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 the return. The saving grace has been rents are outperforming where the pro formas were in these development models. Greg, is that impacting um, how you're designing the materials that you're designing in? No, not really. What what? Uh, that's a good question though. But what I was going to say too, I, I agree with what David said. And what. Uh, what Barrett said, I, I keep a little construction slide. I'm doing that with my hands, uh, where I've got every product type on the planet from on the conventional side, and then generally you add something to that to student because we've got two twos, four fours, more plumbing per square foot, and some other some other factors. So it's usually a little bit higher. But uh, and the other thing, I'm kind of back to your other question. Sorry, 
excuse me, uh, you know, we work all over the country and half of our clients are owner, builder, developers, other half of our projects are third party GCs. So well, I usually get with those guys, I used to do it every quarter. Now I've got to do it every month <laughs> to mm -hmm. keep my numbers updated. <laughs> David's laughing, but, uh, you know, it, it, but he's right. It's moderated. Uh, people aren't having to store things six months out, lumber and all that, like we were doing maybe 18 months ago. Um, like I said, lumber's down, other commodities are up. Uh, and then David hit on it too. We, you would think we'd see better labor or labor coming down, but those guys are still so busy right now that we really hadn't seen that in most markets. Um, and you're, you hit on the, where you're building at, of course, in what region, but um, uh, hopefully that ha the single family pullback, some of those subs and some of those trades, uh, we'll see some relief. I, I think in the second half of this year, uh, Suzanne, we'll see some moderation. I'm hoping, uh, and everybody is on on our hard costs and some of the commodities go back and forth. But we need things to go down five percent, and then we go, and then we need them to go down another five percent, mm -hmm. and then these deals all Barrett's numbers all pencil better that way. Right. But right. Uh, I don't know that we're back to your question. We're not necessarily changing what we're designing. It, we're, you know, back to you know we're still doing walkable to campus product and it's podiums and wraps and sometimes high rises uh, as the sites got smaller as we ate up all the sites the last five six seven ten years by campus that are walkable so you know we're vertical in some cases and uh, and that sort of thing so and we've been doing resorts <laughs> and rooftop yeah. pools and and uh, you know over the top uh, amenities and all because that's kind of been an amenities race now that varies if you're doing 300 beds or 1200 beds on a project, but I wouldn't say we're doing anything different. Um, as far as the materials go, I think that was mm -hmm. your question. Yeah, but on the uh, on the on the uh, amenity side too. Um, right. I know when we've been talking when we've been planning this you were saying that uh, the the interest in the amenities has, has pretty much stayed the same and you kind of just referenced that. Yeah. Um, is there anything changing? Is there any shift back to basics in the shape, uh, in the in the face of a softening economy, or is there any shift to any new features that uh, that you're finding are are appealing? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe maybe post COVID, maybe maybe not COVID. We're still doing the same, um, you know, we're still doing bed bath parity and all that that we've been mm -hmm. doing on the off campus. We're talking about off campus here primarily mm -hmm. for, um, for sophomores and juniors, and then two twos and four fours as far as the bedroom counts and all that. So that really hadn't changed. I think, um, you know, maybe scheduling your fitness appointments instead of mm -hmm. uh, 50 people in a room and some spacing and things like that. But uh, I think we're still doing, you know, smaller study carols, bigger ones, still doing a Starbucks kind of atmosphere uh, on a bigger area in our clubhouses and all that. And, you know, a lot of the same amenities, again, depending on the size of your, uh, your your deal. I mean, I don't know if we're still doing hundred thousand dollar golf simulators anymore, but yes. you know we're still doing the rooftop pools and uh, all those sorts of things in the climates where those are are expected, I guess. And uh, I guess uh, maybe a little more concierge type services, and you know you may have not necessarily a grocer, but grocery vending sort of things. Um, uh, Yama, one of my designers said we're doing Uber lounges. I said, what's an Uber lounge? Yeah. So I guess you're undercover in your vestibule is all that means to me. But, you know, there's some different things like that that um, I guess we're doing. Uh, you know, students, the Gen, Gen Z are attuned to lead and green and those sort of elements. I think they pay attention to that maybe some a little bit more than, uh, uh, you know, your conventional renters might do. So all those sorts of things are still going on. Package lockers that maybe we mm -hmm. weren't doing five, six, seven years ago. Uh, you know, different elements like that. I think there's a few things different, but all in all, we're, we're still kind of, like I said, doing the walkable to campus because that's what ACC and Harrison Street buys and Donna. <laughs> so that whole program hadn't changed. We, we're doing a few that are, uh, I got two new ones in tier one markets that are not that way. They're, they're not walkable to campus. So that's a little unusual, but uh, it's a, a very couple of very big, you know, tier one markets, but uh, you know, necessarily on a shuttle bus, which it, nobody wants to hear shuttle bus, but uh, but I don't think it's changed dramatically. But uh, there's a few elements and and bells and whistles we keep adding, Suzanne. So okay. a couple a couple of things I would add to that. I agree. <clears throat> I think we're still 
checking all the boxes on the amount right. so we might have a smaller footprint Maybe. Some bedrooms might have gotten a little smaller <laughs> excuse me what i'm seeing different <clears throat> is that the current development schedule um, is more friendly to to folks that have experience in the yep. um, uh, market so i think a lot of your you know your <clears throat> better financing is coming through relationship banks and for sure, for um, sure. they're they're looking at folks who have um you know have a <clears throat> have been doing this for longer um you know that the um we all worry on the development side at least we do about recourse and um and i think that that's one of those things that really is uh relates to how much experience you have in the market but we're right now seeing more entitled sites fully entitled sites <clears throat> being brought to us than ever yeah. before and that's because the folks that have done done the the, the um, groundwork are not able to get the financing that they need. Yeah. And if you look at it, I remember again, coming out of GFC, remember that um, we were paying a premium for really class B property. And if you had any kind of new development, how, 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 how well that was received. And I think that's, what's going to be the case after this too. So you figure by the time that these uh, projects that we're building now are delivered, hopefully we'll be in a friendlier interest rate um <clears throat> climate so greg I, I think you're in a good spot now we're well I, and i don't even say we were you know we came out of covid don and went up we're a good barometer people call me and go greg what's going on and is y'all's workload up or off we were we were up i shouldn't even say this on there 20 percent 2021 was a record year last year we were up another 30 <laughs> percent on our whole picture here so i don't know that that keeps going it's kind of like rents we're talking about but we're a pretty good barometer on that as far as you know the much multi-families we do and student and there's a few other firms that do what we do that are great too but uh it's just been incredible donna and um yeah you know, the two main questions i get are what you hit on i get a phone call greg you got any entitled sites <laughs> and the second question is how much is it going to cost so those are the two big questions right now and i, I we're we're seeing the same thing we may be working for not necessarily mom and pop, but maybe somebody that's not a known history and what they're doing on multifamily or student. And they go, we're not going to be able to get this done. We got to have a, either a partner or we want to sell the deal. And maybe we went through the whole entitlement process with them, Donna, like you just, you just hit on, hit the nail on the head. <clears throat> Interesting. So let's talk some about investment. Um, so that we we have some some time to uh, to really get into that more as well, um, David. What kind of deals are currently on the market, and what's getting done? Well, maybe I'll start, and I think Ryan would be a good person to to probably really chime in on that. Oh, one. for sure. But some perspective: twenty twenty two was the record year. I think RCA had uh, total volume 18, 19 billion by our count, probably 23, 24, when you try to capture everything that, that they can't scrape up. Um, and so a boom year where everything traded, individual assets, small portfolios with the big stamp of Blackstone taking ACC private in August after being announced in April. And the pace continued all the way through the third quarter. And then we saw this massive slowdown, November, December, January have been just a fraction of a billion dollar plus average monthly pace then. Um, and you look forward to right now, and uh, I think there's a lot of desire to jump into the space, but it's a similar question on multifamily is how much negative leverage, if you're a levered buyer, are you willing to take to, to jump in today? Um, and, and that's something that um, I think that everyone's trying to figure out. So I would think we're going to have a slow early 23 and probably hopefully a pickup later in 23. I think somebody mentioned hopefully a lower interest rate environment at some point. <laughs> uh, so how long we'll be there and, and how much negative leverage will buyers be willing to accept if they want to jump in the space? Yeah. Ryan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think David on the on the, the main stuff there clearly record year last year. I mean, traditionally what we see is kind of like a six to ten billion dollar mark for for student housing. That's pretty good. You know, you look back seven, ten years ago, that'd be a lot by historical standards, but that's kind of where we started averaging prior to last year, which was obviously a historic year. We had it right around 20 billion as well, half of which was about was the ACC Blackstone transaction, but still another 10 billion or so, call it, uh, that were one-offs and portfolio transactions outside of the uh, the REIT transactions. So significant activity. 
And I think more, more importantly, just the, the amount of capital, new capital that's coming to the space is, is so significant. That's what we think is going to continue driving transaction volume over the next you know, several years, not just this year, but 24 and beyond. You know, clearly, we'd love to say that uh, 23 will be like 22. I think that's a, a far fetch. What it does feel like right now, based on what we're seeing, and there still are deals getting done. We just closed a $170 million single asset deal a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've closed roughly a billion dollars worth of product over the past three months, and we did three and a half billion dollars worth of transactions in the past 12 months. And so we've certainly been uh, busy in a healthy way, and I think that continues on this year. There's There's been a lack of debt liquidity, well, number one, which has been a, a major issue, obviously, and uh, hampers transaction activity overall. But on top of that, just the, the choppiness on the capital market side has just lent more pause to those that are perhaps looking to sell this year and trying to figure out how do I how do I capture the benefits I should be getting from this incredible operational history and performance that I'm getting now and in the future over the next six to 12 months. But combine that with kind of a cautious equity outlook and a lack of debt liquidity, when is the right time to do it? So our sense is there's a, there's a um, yeah, I'd say a moderate amount of product that's on the market now. You'll see, uh, I think, uh, probably a fairly muted transaction uh, volume for the next kind of two to three months. The back half of the year is what we think could be really significant because, you know, if you look at the forward curve and, you, and it shows, you know, and it's typically wrong, unfortunately, but if you look at the forward curve and it's, let's assume that it's potentially in, in the realm of being right this time, and we see rates flatten out at some point in the summer and or coming the opposite direction over the next six to 12 months, uh, that combined with the operational performance that we're seeing for the 23 academic year, and those that have already kind of earmarked deals to go out for 23 could lend for the second half of the year, being one of the busiest second halves of the year, perhaps ever for student housing. Obviously, some of this stuff just has to come to fruition. And uh, there's a lot to, to be de dependent on there in terms of capital markets and debt liquidity for that to happen. Uh, but our sense is with the amount of VIV activity, with what we're underwriting right now, what we currently have on the market and what we're um, basically keeping uh, in the queue, so to speak, for the next three to four months in terms of launching uh, deals, you know, we, we expect second half to be very, very big. I think first half will actually end up surprising folks as well in terms of what gets done because there will be some off-marketed type deals that will be pretty substantial that I know we're working on that will get done as well. So if I had to guess, I, I think we're probably back to, you know, the six to eight billion in that general range uh, for this year, unless something changes dramatically on the on the capital market side here. And I think the second half of the year has, has the potential to be really, really big. And again, with a couple of new groups that we have not seen by over the last couple of years, Donna mentioned some international groups. I think you'll see more kind of out of the Middle East. I know groups out of the Asia Pacific region have kind of been hit by hedging costs, uh, which has uh, hampered their ability to, to go after uh, core deals aggressively. But I think uh, uh, overseas groups, Middle East specific, some institutional capital getting back into the space and that the confluence of new equity groups that have not been student specific Historically, now getting back into the space, I think we'll make a big splash here potentially over the next three to six months. So this year, I think we'll we'll round out to be a, actually a really solid year and probably be in line with historical um, uh, deal flow and transaction volume that we've seen kind of pre-COVID and kind of right after COVID. Sounds like a pretty exciting year for student housing investment. Do you do you see um, an increase in international interest in investing in student housing? In, in, increased international focus on student housing? Yeah, I mean, we, we have. I mean, uh, again, five years ago, international uh, overseas exposure to student housing was almost non, non-existent. It would, it would happen mm. here and there, but it was, was, was not a significant portion of the buyer pool. If you look back, dating a few years back, you know, international overseas exposure to student ended up making up close to 20 to 30 percent, then crept up kind of close to that 50 percent mark. Uh, a couple of years back. And so it's continued to be more prevalent in the space. Um, we, we actually just closed one of the biggest, uh, I think the biggest um, land deal in student housing history just a few weeks ago with a, a group overseas. Uh, the capital is overseas, obviously a, a, a developer here based in the States, uh, but we're continuing to see that it's it dependent on, um, again, the group and what part of the, the world the, the, the capital is coming from. But I think that's going to continue to be just because we've become, we've, we've been such a niche sector historically where there hasn't been enough capital to put out you know when we were trading kind of three to six billion dollars a year many years ago there just wasn't enough capital for a lot of these bigger groups to get excited about scaling opportunities and, and deploying enough capital for them to be happy with what they're doing there or, or for it to make sense for them to spend time on the on the sector we're at a very different space now right where, where we've become institutionalized we have real purpose about product we have uh really sophisticated operators in this space like barrett and donna uh, and David, so we have we have really strong groups now 
um, that are looking for JV opportunities to potentially look for skill opportunities. So international presence is, of course, going to be a con uh, continued big part of the sector. I think the bigger story, though, is going to be domestic capital and, and really big institutional domestic capital groups that will get into the space over the next 12 to 18 months. Obviously, we've seen it with KKR and Blackstone, but there are many, many others that have multi-billion dollar funds that have earmarked certain percentages for student that have not yet you know, dipped their toe in the space that I think will happen over the next six to 12 months. So I think the bigger story is uh, international for sure, continued over the next six to 12 months, but I think the bigger story may be institutional capital, newer equity that uh, perhaps we weren't, um, we weren't expecting over the past six months that may come to fruition here this year. Ryan, we're getting, this is Greg again, we're, <laughs> we are getting as architects, uh, and they, of course they know us in our student housing work and multifamily work too, Humphreys Partners, but um, we've been we've been talking to guys that are developing, and I won't say where, uh, they actually are student housing developers overseas, uh, which is a little different than here, uh, not maybe not quite as sophisticated sometimes, that are coming here. They, they're meeting with us and they probably would JV when they start out, but they've got the wherewithal, the management and the programming of what they've done down. They're trying to learn here. And I'd say they probably will have a joint, joint venture partner. Maybe some of y'all, I don't know, but uh, it's pretty interesting you said that because we're starting to see that too. Agreed. And, and the rest of you as you're, uh, who are investing, are, are you getting uh, inquiries from, uh, investors that are interested in joint venturing with you? I think it's it's not just the joint ventures. It's it's mm -hmm. also that just seeing big institutional funds that have not historically allocated to student housing. Mm -hmm. Those funds have a lot of international investors. And so when they and those funds get raised, the fact that you're even seeing those funds like, you know, Morgan Stanley's of the world, um, TPGs, all those that had hadn't historically been in this the space. Um, that now are in the space, that that is a big indication that those international investors want a, a bigger slice of student housing. So it's not just what you're seeing in like joint venture numbers. Mm -hmm. It's also what's uh, other capital behind the scenes. So it's it's probably higher than what you're seeing quoted. Interesting. So you think about it, you know, with how the global unrest, I mean, if, if, if you're an international, you know, where do you want to put your money right now? Right. I mean, so exactly. it's... Um, uh, while we, we we might complain about the interest rates and some of these things, if you've got money, the United States is still the best place, you know, to invest. So what kinds of um, cap rates are you seeing now and how are those trending? Ha Obviously, it's it's a hot sector that's attracting a lot more institutions, a lot more investor interest. Um, how are you seeing the, the benefits of the investment playing out? Uh, Barrett, we could start with you. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, well, cap rates are up, right? Because of the interest rates. I mean, that, that has to, to dovetail with it. But uh, to David's earlier point, you know, we, we, you know, we have a couple of deals out right now where um, our buyers year one are buying into negative leverage. Um, and they're not, it, it's just not a concern because of where Rencro's going for the uh, 24, 25 academic year, even this year, um, and, and the ability to grow out of it and access, you know, what they hopefully they believe to be top quality real estate. So, you know, class A, class B, whatever you could argue up 25, 50, 75 bips, depending on the type of asset. What's interesting is that that spread to multi, getting back to part of your, your interest, Suzanne, um, may, you know, I think you'll see in the next few months or a couple of quarters may, you know, have never been tighter. And you may even see an inversion, depending on how people look at where rate growth is going. Um, I think that's going to be different across the type of asset class. But historically, you know, part of the reason, you know, Harrison, we years ago got in the sector was that spread between multi was such an opportunity and such a gap and arbitrage opportunity for us because we never understood it. Um, and that's now started to tighten as more uh, people have come into this, this space. You know, which is great for transactional activity and we're super excited about um, but that now that's starting to narrow and that that could continue to narrow um you know over the coming years but i would say it just hasn't gapped out as wide as you might might otherwise expect when you've seen treasuries go 300 basis points um north of where they were in such a tight time frame i mean it's just historical growth and and student housing has not gapped out that much and and that's real in a lot of trades um and, and things we're seeing in the market today Okay. Anybody else before we turn to uh, the Q and A se session? Yeah, I was just going to say I think Barrett's spot on. It. Right now, there's about a thirty basis point spread between student and multi. 
But I think if you look at the forward looking, which we're all talking about in terms of rank growth, I mean, you could potentially be into the high fives on an effective like year one, blended year one, depending on when you're buying a deal, if you're you know, buying it later this fall and you're factoring some of 24. Um, it's very easy to see yourself getting at a negative leverage really, really quickly. Whereas on, on multi, you're, you're really not seeing that. So the spread, I think is probably a little bit wider that's than what's being put, but that obviously averages and everything um, from value add to core and compares it to student value add to core. But if you look at like some belt states where, you know, things are still trading really competitively on the multi side. And to give you an example, there's still you know, low four caps trading in Austin in my backyard here on the conventional side <laughs> where deals are getting 30, 40 offers. We're not seeing that on the student side. And if you compare that to student for a very core deal, we might still be in the fours, but we're not in the four cap range on that type of stuff. So 30 basis points, I think, is the average, but it's probably a bit deceiving in terms of if you compare it to like the best of the best for multi versus the best of the best for student. It's far wider than that, which I think is, a, a like Barrett said, a pretty nice arbitrage and a very nice opportunity in terms of yield profile, but also what you're stepping into and in yield growth uh, in year two for 24 and 25, which I think is really one of the main and most interesting factors for student right now. Okay, well, we do have a lot of questions from the audience, so let's jump over to our Q&A so that we can get a chance to answer as many as we can. Um, first of all, there was um, a, a, a comment earlier, I, I can't remember who said it, but uh, somebody wanted to know a little bit more about why lower density is gaining popularity. Is it easier to approve? Is it a consumer preference? What's feeding into that? Lower density. Um, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know who said that. Maybe I don't know if that was that wasn't me because all we're, we're seeing is, uh, you know, higher density, smaller sites and, you know, ramps and podiums and vertical vertical projects as far as what's being built. So there's a few places where we've done some uh, urban suburban sort of deals like we're doing on conventional, but um, I don't know that it's lower density. I'm not sure. Greg, Greg, what I was what I was talking about was like you know the the, the universities that have gang oh, showers, yeah. you know, yeah, two yeah, to yeah. a bedroom and that sort of thing. So that, that's you. what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I think two different topics. I think you're going to see higher, lower units, smaller unit size. That that has no say for change. sure. I think yeah, we're, we're we that that was last couple of years or even prior to that. Don was I think talking about the de-densification coming out of of COVID a bit, but. Right. The, I think the projects are getting bigger. Units, obviously, is a result that you're seeing more threes and fours as part of that unit mix to make that work. Right. But we're, our, the, the students, I think David pointed this out earlier, um, you know, don't necessarily need big units. They'd rather have some of those amenities. Amenities have changed right. to Greg's earlier point. But unit size has not been a pushback in terms of we need more space. You know, just like in the hotel world, we know that, you know, most hotels getting built these days are your smaller units, and that's been generally accepted which yeah. makes projects more viable, um, but also developers, owners, operators, architects able to deliver projects that um, deliver better common area space, which we're right. um, able to accommodate and makes and gets residents uh, much more excited. Yeah, and uh, the other thing we, we do, and I'm just, uh, we try to make the buildings overall, you know, more efficient on the net to gross. So you don't have so much gross square footage. Now, that's a little harder on a wrap or a podium or something, but we try to do that where we can. Some of that's on the conventional side, yeah. so than the student. But, uh, but I agree that the units we try to do good unit plans. But uh, they're still. I don't think those square footages are going up. They're generally going the other way most of the time. You try to get that out, and then uh, you do over the top on all the amenities, just like you said, for the most part, still, Garrett. And and you know some some pro projects were getting built earlier that had double occupancies in them. Yeah, uh, and I, I think those are all sort of being phased out i think as a result of covid they were sort of going away anyway but um yeah we're not seeing very many of those unless we're really like we're we've got projects where we've got some five fives and six sixes but that's where you're in markets where you're trying to pull in more students that can not afford the 1200 dollar bed rent you know you're trying to get some a little bit more rent spectrum there i think donna so speaking of rents how will rents be affected in housing for small private universities and colleges? And I know nobody wants to make a prediction on Fannie and Freddie, but generally speaking, how will they, uh, what will they use as a minimum enrollment for this coming year to qualify deals to fund? If you could speak generally about that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the small universities uh, ability to push rent in coming years is going to be challenging. Um, I think because of a lot of what we talked about earlier, 
some of the uh, top tier universities or larger universities in given states able to flex and pulling some enrollment away. That's not to say that all small universities are going to struggle. I, I actually think to the contrary, there's a lot of um, you know, even some public, so like the SUNY system in New York, you know, we just bought a deal at, at Binghamton a, a couple of years ago, and, and that's one of the stronger systems in the country with smaller schools with really good outcomes. So it, it's a, a tale of two tastes, but there are, there will, there will be ones where, um, you know, Michigan is one example I can think about the top of my head where Michigan State and Michigan, um, you know, uh, flexed upward coming out of COVID and some of the smaller universities mm -hmm. with the demographic problem they saw there struggled a bit. So there will be some of that. In terms of minimum enrollment sizes for Fannie and Freddie, I won't go there. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what their, their standards, but I, I will say we've heard and we've been on conversation with those guys where they're going to get more aggressive. They want to get in the student space. They got priced out, you know, a lot. I think everyone on this call can attest to early on with the banks and life codes and others that were willing to get a little more aggressive. And they realized probably lost some more deals that they otherwise would have wanted to on their uh, upfront covenant tests um, to, to make sure sizing makes more sense. And I think they may open up their net uh, relative to um, what they were doing before. I don't think they're going to go outside the top two universities is, is my guess, but that's still a large net. Um, and and, and it'll, I think it'll open up the lending world much more for, for a lot of the, the, the people on this call and otherwise, which is exciting uh, to have them in the fold. Yeah, we uh, I, I coincidentally had the folks from Fannie in my office this morning. And so we're talking through a bunch of that stuff and giving them an overview on student housing and everything in between. Um, and, it, and it seems they are very much focused on the affordability. So this mission driven is, is really the, the important factor and, and interesting on the student side, we tend to have affordability components in some of these markets. Like if you look at like West Campus and UT, you have an affordability component. It doesn't really much matter if you have 70% affordable units or 10% because it just gets factored into a certain tranche that Fannie and Freddie are both looking for, Fannie particularly. And so I think to Barrett's point, we've seen Freddie be fairly active over the past 18 months, but it's been interesting because you know, agencies were making up 80% or so of all originations pre-COVID. Pre Obviously, COVID dropped off a cliff, and now they're making up less than 20% of all originations. And so you've seen this big gap filled by debt funds, by banks, and by alternative lenders where it's been good to see. But if we could see Fannie and Freddie start getting back in, into the space, I mean, the, how much that would drive transaction volume is hard to quantify, but I know it would be significant. And so um, so it's, it's possible they get back in the space. I think that affordability mission component is going to be important to figure out alongside student how we fit into that bucket uh, but i think you continue to see them pick and choose freddie probably being a bit more active than fanny and then like barrett said it's for sure going to be more focused on uh top tier 15 to twenty thousand and up enrollment and mostly centered on the publics which is really where a lot of the capital is flowing anyway right now in terms of equity what's your opinion regarding the future of university owned aging university owned student housing dormitories on campus is that going to be another opportunity to replace those i, I guess is the question or or what what will happen with those well barrett's doing all the p3s maybe uh, yeah say, that's all p, that's a p3 question yeah no I, i'm happy to jump in there i would say you know it's interesting i think Every university uh, ha is going to have that concern and that issue, and solving that is a function of two things. One, how do you how do you source that capital to do it? Obviously, we've done a lot of um, uh, P three work um, and new ground up development with universities, um, but you know the ability to go find outsized capital where they don't have to do it on their balance sheet is obviously the opportunity for the P three space and something we're looking to do. The challenge is. Do you, do you have the ability to scrape some of those older buildings to go build new, or is it a renovation plan? And the challenges with renovation, as any developer will tell you, is that budget is so unpredictable, um, you know, from a gut rehab perspective, doing that internally. We are trying to, to come up with different programmatic plans to help um, do that, because a lot of emergencies want to keep a lot of that, um, the, the his, their historical assets, mainly because there has, there's so much character and history tied to those. Um, and they're, they're big statements for them on campus, which we agree with. Um, so being able to solve that problem is going to be is, is one challenge. Um, and then mixing that with phasing out some of the older product that's just uh, older stock that has no relation to them. Coming up with that plan is going to be key, but there's no doubt that that's going to be an opportunity. I think a lot of universities are going to be much more in tune with that. And, they, and um, they've seen it happen over the course of the last five, six, seven, eight years. The capital solutions that um, off balance sheet guys like us and, and plenty of others can provide solves the balance sheet issue, but then also the ability to deliver it um, more quickly than waiting X amount of years to do it in phases. Right. 
Well, and I think the universities may bear, I and mean, maybe I'm just speaking out loud here, but um, they've got to be seeing what's been going on the last decade on this off-campus uh, stuff we've been doing and how that's performed. Not that they want to build resorts everywhere, but, you know, Bed Bath, Perry and all that. You don't have that in those old dorms and everything. You've really got to, like I said, it's a lot of brain damage to convert those, uh, Eric. Yeah, no, the relative comparison to off-campus, Greg, has become much more relevant. So yeah. if yeah. a university is going to house freshmen and allow their dormitories, Correct. Um, and but they know that uh, th in next year they're going to be living in a much better scale yeah. project that like you build it's it's that's putting a lot of pressure on universities to to work on and figure out that stock Suzanne that you mentioned mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I'm that's what I've been hearing too yep okay um here's an interesting one is anyone seeing the sub metering of utilities and student housing the way we have more and more in multifamily <laughs> I don't know if I know the answer to that Donna, may, Donna or these other guys may know that. yeah well we we um we've started breaking out the the the, the water we started doing that you know several years ago metering is um sub metering is is, is definitely a you know a benefit um you know it's interesting so so when student purposeful student housing started you know we had a competitive advantage against conventional in that you know you wrote one check and it included your cable internet your electricity um your water um and then it's sort of like the airlines you I mean the airlines got a competitive advantage when they started giving out miles but then at some point it just becomes an expense right now it's not a competitive advantage so one of the things that's happening in these markets where you know you're competing against um sort of a conventional product you're sometimes at a disadvantage unless that student has really done his homework and understands when he sees that rent starting at, you know, that that one is is more comprehensive. So probably about two years ago, we started, um, you know, charging for water, doing a water cost. And we just literally looked at what the price of water was and, um, you know, and sort of, you know, like, you know, 10 to $20 at least. But we had, we never ever had, and I don't think a single market had pushback. So um, you know, I think uh, student houses started doing caps on electricity or, or creating packages on that, you know, some time ago. The other thing that's a benefit, because these are all expenses, and when you, you know, when you talk about overall NOI growth, you know, <clears throat> sometimes it's tough to, we know that we've got rising staff costs, so you got to figure out what, what you can do to, to compensate for that, but, you know, I think that that's, uh, you know, being able to, to charge for some things like that's been a benefit. Also, dropping cable. I think most of us have probably been dropping cable. So, you know, there's been a, you know, a, 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 um, benefits, you know, uh, you know, to the bottom line, such as those. Uh, let's see, we got a couple more minutes for questions. Um, I don't know if this is the flip side of that or not, but how do you see prop tech and technology as a whole changing how residents engage with your spaces? I think it starts right on the front end with leasing with every generation everybody's a little bit more tech savvy um, and from whether you know your your landing page on your web page or your social media presence how how potential residents engage with you I think that's been a massive change that's not often thought about uh, or talked about and 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 how that reduces the the friction in getting a lease closed how much of that you can move to an automated system chat be GPT if I said that right is Got a lot of headlines, but the chat bots that potential residents can ask questions to and get a lot of answers from um, right on the front end. And then it rolls into operations, your, your ability to um, uh, digitally handle issues that, that residents might have while they're on site on property um, are two big, two big things that we, we see student leading, I think, um, even multi uh, multifamily. Yeah, I think prop tech's gonna be huge. I mean, I would say the two biggest areas are gonna be that frictionless experience. And and Suzanne, you guys in the student uh, multi-center, I, I think seen this you know, even ahead of us, but the frictionless experience where students and our renters are gonna be willing to sign a lease by just doing a virtual tour, not engaging with anyone, doing it at the drop of a button and making sure that not only your website, but the interface is set up to do that is gonna be critical. And the next piece for me is maintenance, because I think there's so much more efficiency you we can create with work, not just work orders, but the ability to evaluate if a job has been done and then preventative maintenance. Um, everyone around here gets sick of me mentioning that because it's just such a big focus, I think, to where we can get more efficient as a sector. 
that's going to be huge. I think there's so many different solutions out there right now, but the difference, and we evaluate a lot of prop tech is that backend API connectivity platform piece, as opposed to what the idea is, because I think a lot of people have the ideas, but if, if, if putting it in practice, there's a wide gap right now. And I think the ones that rise to the top are going to be there, but we, we've got to focus on it as an industry. And I think it's coming. Hey, any further thoughts on that before we wrap up? All right. Well, we do have a lot of questions, but we could just keep going forever and we'll have to cut it off, I'm afraid. Um, we uh, do appreciate uh, all of your interest today, uh, our attendees. Thank you for all of your questions. Um, we'll try to address any that we didn't um, in the future, whether through webinars or through our content. Um, you are also welcome out, welcome to reach out to any of our speakers. Um, we will be sending you all a link when the recording is available. And we hope you'll join us for our next MHN webinar on HVAC technological advances on March 14th. There is a, might be a link in the chat that will give you more information on that. And you can certainly find it on our website as well. If you enjoyed today's session, we do hope you'll also join us for the next MHN Voices webinar or join our upcoming commercial real estate discussions that are offered through Commercial Property Executive and those will be upcoming as well. Meanwhile, once again, I would like to thank all of our speakers for this very interesting discussion and thank you again, all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. See you guys.